Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes, qué gusto saludarlos. Mi nombre es Héctor Chinchilla y en nombre de la Facultad de Biología, Química y Farmacia de Universidad Galileo y la Sociedad Internacional de Ciencias Fitocosméticas, queremos darle la bienvenida al webinar La relevancia de los nutracéuticos en el 2022 y más allá. Una perspectiva socioanalítica. Y para arrancar con esta actividad, queremos agradecerle a todas las personas que ya están conectadas, a ustedes les llegaron un link ya con la presentación en inglés y como español también para que ustedes puedan revisar mientras nuestra invitada vaya disertando su conferencia. Y también queremos agradecerle a cada uno de ustedes, por favor, comentar y realizar sus preguntas, que más adelante vamos a tener un espacio, toda la charla va a estar eh, de, de, desarrollándose en inglés. Y para dar inicio con esta actividad, vamos a escuchar las palabras del presidente de la Sociedad Internacional de Ciencias eh, Fitocosméticas, el doctor Yalal Gaim Gamin. And welcome you to our network of thousands of scholars. Let me offer my thanks to Professor Dr. Anna Valle and her team in Galileo University. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Eh, ahora es momento de escuchar las palabras de la decana de la Facultad de Biología, Química y Farmacia de Universidad Galileo, la doctora eh, Ana Lucía Valle, quien nos va a estar presentando a nuestra invitada del día de hoy. Doctora, ¿cómo está? Gusto de saludarla. ¿Cómo está Héctor? Muchas gracias. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this important event. I want to thank ISPS, the International Society for Phytocosmetic Science, especially to my dear colleagues, Dr. Jalal Gaengami, Chairman of the Board of Directors, and Sara Balawi, event, or, event Director, for their collaboration in making this event possible. Also, I would like to thank the entire Galileo University team for their invaluable help in the organization and technical support of this webinar. Special thanks to our speaker today, Sasha May Debussy. Thank you, Sasha, for your time, your interest, your kind disposition, and your desire to share your knowledge and educate. Sasha is a nutritional anthropologist, graduated from Tufts University and from Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala. She is a researcher, a teacher at the master's program of nutrition and human development at Universidad Galileo, and she is also an entrepreneur. Today, Sasha is going to communicate her experiences and knowledge of nutraceuticals and their impact in health and well-being from a historical and socio-analytical perspective. It is really an honor to work with you all. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon, everyone. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Es un gran gusto estar aquí. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you always for your support and the opportunity to share my perspective and knowledge from a an uh, anthropological and a critical perspective. And um, welcome to everyone who is connected today. And I really look forward to engaging in conversation with you all. Great, welcome. So the title of this webinar is The Relevance of Nutraceuticals in 2022 and Beyond, a Socioanalytical Perspective. I'll take a little bit of time to uh, comment on what it means uh, that I'm taking a socioanalytical perspective. I'd also like to remind you that this uh, presentation is available in Spanish. Um, if you would like to follow along in Spanish, though the, the verbal presentation will continue to be in English, the Spanish document is available. Um, I believe they've shared it via the YouTube link. And also, if you've registered, check your email. And I believe it is um, in an email attachment there. Feel free to, if any if you have any questions along the line, feel free to share, um, share them on the YouTube link. And we will answer them at the end. 
So the different topics that we'll be uh, talking about today is just a, a general um, explanation of, of a socio-analytical perspective. Um, my particular um, education and, and interest. We will also take see an overview of what nutraceuticals are, um, how they are defined, how they are categorized, how what the history of nutraceuticals is, and connecting that to looking back before looking forward. And so, um, it's always important to take um, a historical look as you know what how nutraceuticals came about, what have been some of the recent developments in nutraceutical industry before we see how these trends are developing into the near future, and to connect to uh, and making the logic or connecting the logic between these trends and ultimately human behaviors, we'll talk about the current climate of health behaviors. And here's where the socio-analytical perspective comes in. And uh, wrapping up, we'll uh, discuss some of the tendencies and shifts for 2022 and beyond in the next decade or so. Um, examining potential future of nutraceuticals, potential downfalls, and recommendations um, from my personal perspective. And at the end, we will have time to um, answer all, any questions that you may have. So perspective, uh, I am not a um, biological scientist. I'm not an ethnobotanist. I am a nutritional and food anthropologist. And my interest is in health behavior science and the cultural, historical, and social contexts in which health behaviors develop. Uh, I also write content um, on behalf of the food and nutrition industry via nourished writing. And this presentation will include historical and socioanalytical perspective of the trends in nutraceutical applications, connecting it to a food justice perspective and also understanding uh, the different elements that influence how humans make health behaviors or for behave health behaviors. Um, so you might have heard uh, the quote that Hippocrates supposedly said is, um, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. So this is a common misquotation. Um, Hippocrates actually has never said this. <laughs> there, at least there's no evidence of it. Um, however, it is quoted very often. Um, <clears throat> what Hi uh, Hippocrates and his, his um, students um, really tried to connect because there wasn't a, there was a very clear definition from the Hi Hippocratic perspective between food and medicine um, is that uh, the diet and the lifestyle that we follow can have a big influence on our health on our health excuse me and it is the best way to um, to prevent illness and so what what it says in the original writing of the Hippocratic oath which um, Met, uh, doctors need to take when they, or often take depending on the system, when they graduate is, I will apply dietetic and lifestyle measures to help the sick to my best ability and judgment. I will protect them from harm and injustice. So this is the actual quote um, from Hippocrates that is closest that uh, has been able to be identified in his texts. Um, of course, it wasn't only in the West that we um, humans have understood the impact of diet on health and well-being. So a Chinese proverb says, um, the disease comes through the mouth. And so understanding this is that um, I, a, a, not paying attention to what we are putting in, through, in, in our bodies through what we eat will end in illness, right? Um, so understanding that this is really a cross-cultural perspective and this is not new. This is age, ages old, understanding the connection between what we eat and how that impacts our health and well-being. Okay, so transitioning into the introduction to nutraceuticals, you may or may not have heard of nutraceuticals. You may or may not really understand, maybe as a buzzword, you've heard of them, um, really understanding what they are and how they are connected to functional foods, which you may um, uh, know a little bit more about. So the definition of nutraceuticals, according to Waldman, is there are chemicals found as a natural component of foods or other ingestible forms that have been determined to have a to be beneficial to the human body in preventing or treating one or more diseases or improving physiological performance. Essential nutrients can be considered nutraceuticals if they provide benefits beyond their essential role in normal growth or maintenance of the human body. An example is the antioxidant properties of C and E. 
So not only uh, providing the body with the essential uh, components it needs to function, but actually having a positive impact on our health and well-being beyond those uh, basic functions. And how does it connect to functional foods? So functional foods um, are defined as a food, either natural or formulated, which will enhance physiological performance or prevent or treat diseases and disorders. Functional foods includes, the, includes those items developed for health purposes as well as for physical performance. The Institute of Medicine's Food Nutrition Board defined functional foods as any food or food ingredient that may provide health benefit beyond the traditional nutrients it contains. So they are directly connected. Nutraceuticals um, are a type of uh, functional food or a subcategory of functional foods by most definitions. So nutraceuticals are components in plants, animals, yeast, and fungi, as well as bacteria. They may be part of an intact food, course, food source. So if we take the example of lycopene and the different ways in which it can be um, consumed. So we see lycopene in tomatoes and the whole tomato. It can also be part of a processed food like lycopene in salsa or in ketchup. It can be provided in supplemental form. And it can also be a fortified substance in food, like lycopene added to fruit juice. So to understand that uh, we often think of um, healthy products as whole products, right, or potential supplements. But this is important to visualize that processed foods and ultra processed foods can also may or may also contain um, nutraceutical, com nutraceutical co excuse me, components in them. To understand the concept of nutraceutical, the word nutraceutical arose from um, the combination of um, under, our understanding of pharmaceutical technology and of nutrition, uh, which is why we see nutra from nutrition and suitable from pharmaceutical. The concept of nutraceutical also uh, is kind of an intermediate between or, or connecting um, factor between um, drugs and food. Right. And so if we think of uh, so, so a lot of components that come from drugs inspired in plants, though not always, they can be directly from um, from the laboratory, but they may be inspired in plants or extracted from plants uh, that th the drugs can be for disease treatment as well as for prevention. Uh, nutraceuticals uh, come from food, right, or may be found in foods and they're direct benefit, they, they can have direct health benefits, but are also primarily for prevention of these diseases. I may, I should mention that there is an interest in applying nutraceuticals for disease treatment or as part of um, disease treatment as well. So some of the potential benefits of, um, of nutraceuticals include, <clears throat> excuse me, increasing the health value of the diet. So not only meeting our basic nutrient needs, but thinking about uh, making the body function more efficiently, um, reversing some of the uh, damage or the effects of, um, of a, a negative lifestyle or exposure to toxins um, or even damage uh, due to other um, diseases. It may increase longevity. They, which is a big buzz topic right now, is incre how to increase longevity or um, health span, right? So then health span is the number of years in our life that we are healthy um, rather than just lifespan, thinking about health span, avoiding, helping avoiding chronic and acute health conditions, having a physiological benefit from doing something for your, well sorry, not physiological, psychological benefit from doing something for your well-being. So feeling good, knowing that uh, what we are consuming is having a benefit for our health, which also has an impact on our health behaviors, which we will discuss later on. Uh, nutraceuticals are perceived as more natural than pharmaceuticals. Thus, they're less likely to have unpleasant side effects. And here's the connection, as I mentioned before, where there's also there's an intention of, on the nutraceutical industry side to have more clinical benefits, right? So the connection into treatment as well as um, prevention. Um, Excuse me. They also prevent present beneficial foods for people with special needs. Um, so people who have may have special needs due to conditions that they may already have, or limitations um, uh, in diet and um, and access. 
some of the health areas that are covered by nutraceutical foods and products <clears throat> um, is coronary heart disease, which is one of the most popular. Uh, so thinking about the different factors that may affect coronary heart disease. So um, inflammation, if we're thinking about blood pressure, or although that's also connected to hypertension, if we're thinking about cholesterol and triglyceride levels, those are all connected to coronary, the risk of coronary heart disease. Cancer, so if we think a lot of, a lot of the an antioxidant um, and yeah, antioxidant components in food are connected to the anti-cancer um, uh, benefits of certain nutraceuticals at, from a preventative perspective. And lipid control, right? So connected again to um, uh, tr triglyceride and cholesterol levels. Osteoporosis, which is actually one of the first benefits of, or, or when the, the whole concept of nutraceuticals arose was the benefit of calcium beyond its basic functions in understanding um, the role of calcium consumption early on in its, in its prevention of osteoporosis. Diabetes, which is a big one now, especially with the rising um, uh, prevalence of diabetes around the world, and hypertension. So you can see some of these are interconnected. So hypertension, lipid control, and um, coronary heart disease are all uh, very connected. So these are some of the areas that are covered by nutraceutical foods and nutraceutical products. This is just to give you an idea of some of the clinical or potential clinical applications of nutraceuticals. So this is a particular component called glutamine dipeptide that is found in, um, in great quantities in muscle tissue um, that can be extracted from muscle tissue of animals. Um, and the different effects they can have in a clinical perspective. So really thinking about um, the potential for nutraceuticals in terms of treatment, right? So here we talk about um, nitrogen, nitrogen balance, weight gain in hematological patients that was improved, protein synthesis was increased, the expression of, of anti-inflammatory cytokines was enhanced, um, muscular glutamine concentration is maintained, Trauma-related intestinal atrophy was avoided, and chemotherapy, excuse me, chemotherapy-induced mucotitis was reduced, right? And so then also seeing the length of, the length of hospital stay, mortality, and the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines were all reduced. So seeing the potential of, uh, this is a very, very specific example, but just seeing the potential of nutraceuticals in their applications together with other treatments in a clinical um, environment. Most, however, most of the applications and the popularity of nutraceuticals arose because of the preventative health applications. So this is an example of one category of nutraceuticals, which are spices, right? And so seeing the, the documented health potential and health benefits of these spices. So looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the potential health benefits, we see lowering of blood cholesterol, um, prevention of dissolution of cholesterol gallstones, protection of erythrocyte integrity, hypoglycemic potential, amelioration of diabetic neuropathy, nephropathy, excuse me, antioxidant effect, anti-inflammatory and anti-arthritic effect, anti-mutagenic effect, which, also, which uh, means that it's cancer preventing, and digestive stimulant action, antimicrobial. So thinking antimicrobial from as, as thinking from a um, infectious point of view, and also thinking of a chronic disease point of view. And so we see a lot of overlap. These are some of the common spices that are linked to these health benefits. Garlic, onion, fenugreek, turmeric, um, or curcumin, red pepper. Um, and we see a lot of these ginger oil, mustard, um, ahuan, coriander. So we see a lot of overlap in these. Onion, which is a very, very common here, it's, it's referred to as a spice. In, in some perspective, it's seen as a, as a vegetable, but because of the, the way that it's applied in gastro, gastronomic, um, from the gastronomic perspective, it's seen as, um, as a spice. And so what we're seeing here is a lot of um, spices that have been used traditionally for thousands and thousands of years um, in, in, human, in the human diet. And a lot of these also have been used traditionally as medicines, right, or um, as different treatments, which we'll look at when we look at the history um, of, of this term nutraceutical. So the perspective that that spices, that particular food elements have beneficial effects for our health is not new, 
This is something that is age old. And um, just in recent history, thinking about from the Western, Western perspective, this might seem, this is very new because the Western perspective um, values the biomedical perspective. And until there were concrete studies that demonstrated their benefit of beneficial effect, um, it, it wasn't seen as something that could be taken seriously. Um, and now we're finally seeing this, this overlap, right? So the kind of the tilting of the hat of um, to these age old approaches and seeing the, the, the impact that spices in this case can make on our health, we're now seeing that overlap in the research. So what are some of the categories of nutraceuticals? This is the, the traditional uh, seven categories of nutraceuticals. We see antioxidant vitamins, we see dietary fiber, prebiotics, spices, and here just as there, there is often an overlap here, but here we're talking about a smaller component, spices, polyphenols, probiotics, po and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So depending on the approach that we're taking, um, these are connected to the health effects of each of these. Right. So it's not uh, it's, it's doesn't mean that one component can is only within that one category, but it's talking about the health effects of the nutraceuticals. And nutraceuticals can also be talked about as either established or potential. So established um, depends on kind of a a community consensus that there are certain um, uh food components or supplements or yeah food components or foods in general that can be um that have already been established to be nutraceuticals then there are some that have sparked interest but the scientific community has not yet decided that it is a nutraceutical okay so looking back and this is really important to kind of put things into perspective and how nutraceuticals have come about in this term nutraceuticals have come about and what's really interesting about this is that it really connects um, just the way that we think about food, the way we think about um, the preventative uh, effects of diet and the overall health effects of what we eat and how we prepare our foods. So as I mentioned earlier, um, way before <laughs> we talk about nutraceuticals or we talk about even um, the arise of um, Hippocrates and his followers, um, we have to remember that edible plants and animals um, with special health properties have been used for tens of thousands of years. So indigenous cultures use tonics, tinctures, and teas. And you may have seen that recently, we've even, uh, some um, chimpanzees were, ha were seen having applied insects onto the wound of another chimpanzee. So this shows that we are wired to understand uh, as, you know, being gen genetically connected to chimpanzees, that we are wired to identify elements in our environment that can be applied to the human bi body or consume that will have a benefit on our health. And so, uh, it's important to mention this because we tend to think of medical advancements as purely Western or biomedical. And it is really important to understand that um, while uh, because of the way that Western um, or Westernized science has really taken hold of how we communicate, we cannot forget that this knowledge is age old. So a lot of the uh, foods and components that we see as nutraceuticals today um, uh, our ancestors worldwide have known that, that they have health benefits for a long time. So then when we're thinking about going into the um, Hippocratic era, right, the naturalist stage, so starting from Hippocrates and believing that um, there was all, that in all foods, there was one universal nutrient and um, thinking about foods as separate from, um, from, uh, medicine. I was going to say pharmaceuticals. That's different. And as foods are separate from medicine. And so that foods, um, they shared one universal nutrient, which was important for our health and well-being. Then there's the chem uh, chemist analyst stage in the 18th century. And this corresponds to the development of nutrition as a science. And so this is, is when we started examining um, food composition um, the minuscule elements that actually affect our body and how these are metabolized. Then we see the technological legal stage um, in the 20th century to now. 
and this is this is the era that we are currently in we look at demographic changes that led to advances in the food supply chain technology and food regulation so this was a boom in how not only in understanding the the components of food itself but understanding um uh how, how the different ways that we manipulate food um, through technology affects um, access, it affects um, and our access to, to food components as a whole, but our access to food components also on, on a minimal scale. And how these are distributed, thinking about how to keep these safe, um, and uh, also uh, thinking about the organoleptic pro properties of, of food and how these can be manipulated um, for our enjoyment, essentially. So the concept of nutraceuticals is actually incredibly new. It's uh, It was coined in 1989 and it kind of spurred the nutraceuticals revolution. And the term nutraceutical was coined by Stephen DeFelice and he defined it as any substance that is a food or part of a food and provides medical or health benefits, including the prevention or treatment of disease. So you see that here, Stephen DeFelice already saw the potential of nutraceuticals to be applied as a treatment for disease. So, uh, bromatology or food science can um, has predominantly been advanced by Western interests and, approach, and approaches, but we must not forget that indigenous cultures knew about health doting and medicinal properties of foods long before it was popular. Knowledge considered non-scientific is now sparking interest in uncovering specific components that are offer that offer those health effects. So now that we say, oh, you know, they 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 were right or or there is a logic to this having been used for so many centuries and so now um, a biomedical perspective is being applied to these to this traditional knowledge and there is a risk in that as well um, in separating that scientific knowledge from uh from its origin and it's it's uh, not necessarily its origin but its or origin in um in its inspiration. So who, who inspired uh, these researchers to look into this? What are some recent developments in the nutraceutical industry? When we talk about industry, uh, a good marker of seeing uh, how popular this, this uh, term and this industry is growing is by looking at its market value. And so we talk about the nutraceutical revolution um, this was, uh, and one thing I forgot to mention in the history. So one of the reasons why the New Physical Revolution was so important is because uh, for the first time in scientific history, the role of mass media. So in the 1980s, talking about newspapers and magazines particularly, and maybe TV, radio, um, started taking a lot of the research that had been going on and communicating it in a way that was understandable for the general population. And this had a huge impact and is now uh, really revolutionized the way that um, the general population understands health information. And so um, the original nutraceuticals revolution talked a lot about the benefits of calcium, fiber, and fish oil. So now you have the general population understanding components that had only been talked about maybe in the, the um, nutrition and food science um, professions. And now the general population is able to talk about these components. Um, and then uh, around in, in the early 1990s, you see kind of a conversion of several segments in the industry. So you see functional foods, dietary supplements, and herbal and natural products um, kind of converging, converting or, yeah, in, into the nutraceutical um, industry. So just to compare how fast this is growing. So in the market value in 2002 and 2007, so in 2002, uh, the market value was 46.7 billion. And in 2007, it was 74.7 billion. So in, within a couple of years, within five years, um, it was close to doubling. Now, last year's market value we see is 454.55 uh, billion. So we see that in the last 19 years, um, almost 20 years, this has grown by 1,000%. Um, and it shows the impact that mass media can have, how uh, the how the population has been hungry for finding a way where they can take control over their health again. 
And so what does this mark what, what is this market or this industry composed of? We see uh, about 40 percent of those are functional foods, 35% are dietary supplements, and 15% are functional beverages. So functional beverages, if you think about um, kombucha or you think about yogurt uh, drinks, etc. Um, there and maybe even some teas as well. So we see clearly that there is a growing demand for supplements and functional foods. What are the different forces that are fueling people's interest in nutraceuticals? So we see that there are rocketing high healthcare costs and very poor access to healthcare due to poor distribution. And so uh, thinking about healthcare, thinking about um, um, the the benefits of avoiding the need for healthcare. Um, people are really seeing those benefits and seeing, okay, I want to avoid having to go to the clinic. I want to avoid having to go to the hospital as much as possible. And one thing I can do to do that is really take control of what I put in my body, what I eat, and um, nutraceuticals give me um, a sense of empowerment in doing so. So there's also rapid advances in scientific knowledge that support the vital role of diet in health and disease prevention. So we know that diet is one key element in the human lifestyle that can help promote overall wellness. But from a, a, from a Western perspective, we usually think of health as the absence of disease. And so when we talk about as long as I'm not ill, I'm healthy, right? Um, and we talk about health. Uh, ill, not only physically, but we're talking about psychologically, et cetera. And so we're thinking about the connection um, and, and seeing the evidence of the connection between how what we eat can actually help us uh, live longer, healthier lives. There is a general, uh, as we stand today, there's generally a positive consumer um, attitude towards nutraceuticals, even if they do not um, um, understand or have not heard of this word. So thinking about the different categories, fiber, probiotics, prebiotics, and people tend to see these different um, categories of nutraceuticals as positive and beneficial. There's also a change in the regulatory environment, which uh, can which benefit the um, expansion in the marketing of nutraceuticals. There's also an aging population. So um, we live in an age where the current population is living longer, and thus we have an aging population. And so with that comes a greater risk for diseases of aging, and there's an interest in um, using diet as a way to improve well-being in, uh, later in life. There's also a general growing distrust of conventional pharmaceuticals, again, connected to just high healthcare costs. Um, high costs of the pharmaceuticals and the, and the limited access of them and the fear of, um, of side effects. There's also uh, more globalization and cross-cultural communication than we've ever seen due to social media and the internet. And so this allows us to access information about uh, uh, historically cultural foods that have a positive, that could potentially have a positive impact on our health and well-being. We mustn't forget that the age we are now, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, has really uh, sparked an interest in supporting the immune system via a healthy diet. So the uh, promotion of lifestyle as a way directly to support the immune system, of which diet is one, one key element. And lastly, the technological advances in the food industry um, that are marketed to health conscious consumers. So again, the use of the media and now the incredibly powerful tools of social media to communicate um, the research, right? So what's going on in the ivory towers to the general population. So now in order to kind of transition and thinking about, okay, what are we going to see for the future um, as, a, as an anthropologist and as a person interested in health behaviors, really looking at, okay, so if humans are the ones that are fueling this, um, this growth and this interest, and we must understand the different components that are affecting or that may impact how humans behave um, in, in terms of the, the actions that affect our health, right? So what are health behaviors? The, one of the shortest uh, um, definitions is health behaviors are actions taken by individuals that affect health or mortality. So actions that we take can, that can affect our health and well-being and our um, risk of dying, essentially. Health behaviors can be intentional or unintentional. So when we talk about intentional, think about, okay, I'm going to um, drink more water because I know that hydration is, is 
um, important for my well-being. So that is a health behavior that I'm intentionally doing in connection to my health and well-being. An unintentional health behavior um, may be something that I do out of habit or um, out of a cultural um, expectation. So um, thinking about um, the way that we prepare food. So if we think about traditional um, uh, Mediterranean diet, for example, those are cultural patterns of preparing uh, food that are were not necessarily intentional. That's just the way things are done. And we know now that the traditional way of preparing uh, foods and the selecting foods in the, in the med tr traditional med Mediterranean diet are uh, beneficial for our health. So health behaviors can also promote or detract from our health, right? So when we're talking about health behaviors, it's not only pro-health behaviors, it's just uh, different um, elements that affect our health and well-being. So some examples are smoking, diet, substance use, uh, physical activity, sleep, hydration, sexual activity, including risky sexual activity, healthcare-seeking behaviors. So just to give you an example, healthcare-seeking behaviors is um, I'm sick, who am, who am I going to see? Or I'm just going to deal with it at home, or I'm going to ignore it. Um, or um, if I do go to the health to the healthcare professional, adherence to the medical treatment. So once they say, okay, um, yes, you have diabetes. This is this is the mode of action. These are the changes that um, you need to try to make in your health behaviors to promote your health and well-being. My ability to, and it's not all, only conscious, and this is important to 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 keep in mind. There are um, other elements beyond choice that affect my ability to adhere to medical treatment, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And health behaviors can be measured and summarized for individuals, groups, and populations. So health behaviors, are not, we're not only talking about the individual from a clinical perspective, but thinking about public health approaches, it's important to understand health behaviors from um, groups and, and population perspective. We also remember that health behaviors are dynamic, just like culture, right? They're dynamic. They vary across the lifespan, cohorts, settings, and time. So if we are taught to do things in a certain way, it does not mean that we will continue to do that forever. We, are, we as humans, we have the ability to change our health behaviors. And also the context in which we are will, can also affect our health behaviors. Very simple example is uh, the, the, when the declaration of, of the pandemic began, there was a significant change in health behaviors in terms of social distancing, in terms of washing our hands, um, and in terms of even the cultural effects of um, the way we said hi to each other, right? Um, also had impact on what we ate and how we eat. So that was something in the very recent history that had a global impact on our health behaviors. At the same time, that had a negative impact on some mental health behaviors or be health behaviors that affected our mental health. So what are some, connecting this to nutraceuticals, what are some health behaviors around nutraceuticals? So um, we see foods that have nutraceutical proper, properties that are already part of the eating pattern. So um, foods that we don't really think much about that are already part of the way we eat. And so if we think about um, the diet in Peru or Ecuador where quinoa uh, was a very important staple and now it's considered a nutraceutical food. And so that was already something that they were eating as part of their staple diet. Um, and now the world understanding the benefits of, of foods like quinoa um, or if they could like moringa um, locally is, uh, or chia is another one that we see in Guatemala, or chan. Uh, these are foods that we now know have nutraceutical benefits, but those were already consumed, right? So that we're not consuming because of the nutraceutical benefits, but because they were already consumed in the, in the population. Another is making a conscious choice to consume nutraceuticals because we know that they have a benefit for our health and well-being. Um, another is on a cohort or population level, elevating nutraceutical foods within a culture or geographic area. So um, thinking about uh, in, in Guatemala, for example, identifying foods with nutraceutical potential um, that can have a significant impact on our health and well-being if they are integrated into our diet, right? Um, and so if we think locally about amaranto, we think about chia, um, we think about a shamat, we think about um, 
just end, I'm, I'm blanking right now, but endless um, herbs and foods that have a direct impact on our health and well-being, these are becoming popularized, right? But if we are able to elevate these, if these are being elevated geographically, that actually increases the access and it makes it makes it more probable that we'll be consuming this. Another is seeking content and information related to health promoting foods and components. So actually seeking that. So doing your own research, being interested in reading about this. So that is something that's going to affect um, our health behaviors around nutraceuticals. And then if, if either I'm interested in this or I've actually experienced um, the effects of nutraceuticals on my health and well-being and how I feel, um, I may be interested in informing others about how diet and food choice can impact disease risk and risk reduction. So um, social media is a really, really powerful tool for this, just sharing articles, sending um, little snippets of media information to our, um, our network uh, can influence the health behaviors and others. And then another important health behavior is just being more critical of the information that we're reading, right? Um, and so this may detract from the consumption of nutraceuticals or it can promote, right? So saying, hmm, this sounds a little sensationalized. This, this one food cannot, you know, uh, cure my cancer, right? And so really being more critical about it is um, if, if it happens on a population level can actually affect the quality of the information that is being developed, excuse me, developed. So I wanted to just uh, take a moment to think about the different patterns, this is, this is Barry Ems Popkins' uh, famous um, uh, patterns of, of the nutrition transition, right? And so you may have heard of the nutrition transition, a transición nutricional, and thinking about just how the adoption of, sh of certain um, lifestyle behaviors, particularly around diet, has influenced our risk of um, non-communicable non -communicable diseases. So we currently find ourselves, depending on the country, depending on the, so the, the social stratus in which we are as well. Um, and just as, if you haven't seen this before, I'll just uh, summarize it um, very quickly. So this is talking about human history and the different general eating patterns that we've had over human history. And so um, what the pattern one is collecting food. So we're thinking about um, the era when there were very, very few humans on this planet. Uh, we had to compete with uh, directly with um, other mammals and uh, we collected our food. Uh, we may have hunted as well. There was pattern two, and as we uh, transitioned into agriculture and um, as a result of um, the reduction of famine, but that also made us much more vulnerable to famine. Then pattern three, we tried to reduce the famine by in, uh, increasing the access to uh, uh, car carbohydrate-rich foods, and that happened through the agriculture of these carbohydrate-rich foods. Um, as a shift, and we kind of see the, the overlap here with the um, technological legal era in which we are in, um, we'll find ourselves in pattern four or pattern five. And so in pattern four, we see um, a, an increased uh, prevalence of chronic diseases due to the, um, the diet that we've led, right? And so increased fat, sugar, processed foods and diet, and not only due to the diet, I'll say also due to growing population and uh, significant um, uh, kind of gaps in access to, to healthcare and gaps in access to information, um, food quality, et cetera. So today we're, we're dealing with a lot of non-communicable diseases and we are, um, as a humanity, inventing um, and developing medical cures that will help keep us alive in, as we deal with these. But now there's a greater interest in not only just keeping us alive but, and, and uh, lengthening the number of years, but actually the quality of living that we have. And so preventing these from, from arising in the first place. And so here we find ourselves in kind of this transition between pattern four and pattern five. And so we, we are hoping to see a reduced consumption. And this is a little bit outdated. Um, this is from 2015. There's a little bit more information now, but still, um, still relevant is reducing the consumption of refined foods in general, so ultra, ultra processed foods, which often contain refined carbs, um, uh, saturated fats, and increasing our consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, all of which have a very dense nutraceutical content, right? 
drinking more water as opposed to juice, as opposed to sodas, um, and replacing sedentarism with purposeful um, increases in physical activity. So throughout this, we have we've only barely touched on um, the role of physical activity, but seeing this physical activity is also an important component of health behaviors. Um, and here we're talking about reduced disease prevention, right? Um, and that's the purpose of um, understanding the role of nutraceuticals. And if we don't if we don't like that term, nutraceuticals is really the role of um, a nutrient dense diet. So to, here we, we, we see, again, behavior change, right? And this is why I've been so um, interested in the role of um, the impact of behavior change on um, how we consume nutraceuticals and understanding nutraceuticals. So again, as I mentioned before, health behaviors are not just about choice. It's not just about, oh, I'm going to um, go to the gym today, or I'm going to eat a salad um, and put some olive oil and some um, amaranto on it. It's not just about the choice. And there are social determinants. So um, whether I have access to a gym, whether it is safe to walk outside, whether um, what are the costs of the foods that are promoting health, those are all social determinants that will affect my uh, the, the probability that I will adopt positive health behaviors. And that is connected to the recommendations that I'll make at the end. So social determinants approach to health behaviors seeks to understand how to how the social world shapes people's health. So one way to understand social determinants is the downstream behaviors, so individual, the body, and the upstream upstream behaviors, so like the social structure and access. We tend to talk about mostly as health behaviors as downstream, so like, oh, it's their own fault that they developed that, or it's their own fault that they, you know, we, we tend to place a lot of, of the responsibility on the individual, and because it's just harder to talk about um, and think about solutions on the upstream um, causes of health behaviors. So some examples, and these are as it relates to nutraceutical con consumption. So some of the downstream health behaviors that may affect nutraceutical consumption are like clinical recommendations or standards of care. So if neutral, nutraceuticals are integrated into standards of care and the doctor, the nutritionist is making recommendations directly, that is a downstream behavior. If information is accessible via the media, and we're talking about uh, the quality of the information is important, right? So newspapers, social media, and for people who do not have access to new, uh, newspapers and social media, thinking about radio, which is uh, continues to be an important element in uh, many rural areas in the world, and television as well. Um, marketing directed at individuals. Um, and a lot the marketing tactics, tactics today are highly individualized and physiological factors like cravings, desires, um, habits, positive effects on well-being after consuming. So really saying, oh, wow, you know, that made me feel good or I didn't really like how that made me feel is going to affect my health behaviors. But then we're thinking about some of the upstream or um, kind of societal, societal effects of um, or elements that will impact health behaviors as it relates to nutraceutical consumption. So nutraceutical regulation, right? Um, and then these two big big ones is the cost distribution and access to the information of nutraceuticals. So who has access to the information and how is this information written? Who is, and who, how is it described? So who is this information for? And the cost distribution and access to nutraceutical foods and or supplements, right? So. Uh, there's an educational aspect to this, but there's also an access um, aspect to this. So if we are talking about really improving health and well-being and make sure, making sure that everyone is in this behavior uh, change pattern, then we need to make sure that cost distribution, access to information and nutraceuticals is equitable. Oh, the future of nutraceuticals. What does it look like this year and beyond? So we will see um, in the next several years, increasing rates of chronic disease levels as we transition from pattern four to pattern five. And a lot of these disease diseases are, call are called diseases of aging. Um, so we will see as an increased, um, just an increased need for, um, and also fear of really developing a lot of these diseases and thinking, how can I prevent it? Increasing awareness about fitness and health, and this is thanks in great part to the media, right? And so 
thinking about the media and its potential to do good things in informing the general population about um, how different just health behaviors can affect our health and well-being. There's a continuous growing trend toward the desire for health products and healthy products or products that promote health um, as seen uh, as reflected in the growth of the market. There's a continuous growing tr trend towards overall health behavior change as we shift into uh, pattern five. There's a trend away from ultra processed nutraceuticals. Um, and so when we talk about ultra processed, so humans have always been processing food, right? So we talk about processing as drying, cooking, peeling, et cetera. That is processing. But we're talking about ultra processed foods. We're talking about um, the industrial processes that actually strip away a lot of the nutrients in foods. And so if you remember that graphic towards the beginning where we, talk, where we see the different ways in which glycopene can be consumed, sauces, juices, um, supplements, and the whole tomato. And so there will be likely a trend away from the ultra processed nutraceuticals. So not so much as, as seeing them added to foods, but actually seeking out foods um, that contain them or on the other extreme, um, seeking out supplements because the supplement industry is also growing significantly. The private sector will continue to take the lead in innovation as that is where the funds are where the money is to do research and development. Um, this has a potential ne negative side, but also um, is good news in terms of um, just the interest in the sort of research that we can have access to. There will also be, be more, excuse me, more categories, more foods and more products. The, some of the other changes will depend on the perception of consumers of the link between diet and disease. And so, um, if, uh, as it stands, there's very, very, very strong evidence that links the connection between what we eat and disease. But it sounds really easy. When we think about diet, um, think about all of the different, and, and diet is not restrictive, but rather the eating patterns, right? And so when we think about what is really the best eating pattern <laughs> to prevent disease, and everyone will have a different answer, right? Some will say, oh, it's a vegan diet. Others will say it's a high protein diet. Others will say it's a diet that um, limits carbohydrates. So there's still a lot of kind of murky water in terms of what exactly is the perfect diet or the ideal diet um, to promote health, right? But what is sure is that diet has a direct impact on the risk of disease. Um, next is we'll see a much more multi-sectoral co collaboration um, to plan regulation that will provide health and therapeutic excuse me, uh, therapeutic benefit to humans, culture, and the environment. So thinking about um, a shift away from uh, only looking at the short-term benefits to humans and thinking about um, a shift away from only profit and really thinking about uh, as, as consumers do become more educated, to become more empowered with that information is really looking critically of how nutraceuticals are obtained, how they are, how they impact the environment, how they impact cultures, right? And so if we think back to um, about a decade ago where the, the impact of the elevation of quinoa, for example, really had a negative impact on the price of quinoa for those for whom quinoa was um, a staple, right? And so thinking about that critically and saying, okay, how can we um, have access to nutraceutical foods, but that are more responsible to the environment, to humans, um, and to longevity? Uh, we will definitely see more long-term clinical studies to, val to validate nutraceuticals as medical and nutritional therapy. So not only thinking about preventative and general health benefits, but also thinking about how it can be in integrated into therapy and treatment. Um, there will be more accessible nutraceutical therapy, therapy in clinics and hospitals, and these will hopefully be low cost and widely available, um, as opposed to a premium um, uh, kind of treatment that is only available in, in the, the highest cost uh, hospitals and clinics and those with ac access to insurance. Right. So thinking about these as a low cost option rather than a premium option. There will also be a convergence of new and old science on preparation and processing methods. And so really bowing our heads to the, the, um, the population's 
away from the, that, that we're not necessarily connected to the biomedical model of thinking that knew that a lot of these, these foods did have nutraceutical properties or health benefit property properties. Uh, we'll also see more informed and critical health professionals, and it will come with skepticism. And skepticism is always good because it pushes the media and it pushes the, um, the regulating bodies and it pushes the, um, the private sector to do better and to be more responsible. There will also be a growing list of established and potential nutraceuticals. This is, from my perspective, from a socioanalytical perspective, what are some of the potential downfalls of nutraceuticals? Uh, barriers to access or barring access to those for whom nutraceutical foods are staples. And so, again, nutraceuticals are seen often as, as um, premium foods. Um, and that makes it so that only a small population can have access to them. But it's not only to the foods themselves, but also to the information. So another risk is the media, um, which has have been very important in, in, in empowering the, um, the, the general population is oversimplifying or sensationalizing research, which happens very often, right? And so not talking about nutraceuticals as a magic pill as it connects to the, to the next one. So um, the media oversimplifying or sensationalizing research can really damage the perception of nutraceuticals seeing as, as like gimmicky. So seeing the healthification of ultra processed foods, right? So a food that because it has added fiber um, is now this miraculous food, um, even though it may not have almost any other um, nutrient except for fiber. Um, there's, it can also lead to the promotion of nutraceuticals as a magic pill for health. And over the last uh, two decades or so, um, humans have generally been very skeptical of these so-called magic pills. And so nutraceuticals need to be seen as one element in a larger kind of lifestyle impact. Um, next, it can also have an impact on ignoring the importance of overall lifestyle for sustained health and not just, you know, eating like kind of a shift away from superfoods, that term superfoods, right? Foods, there are no superfoods, there are just foods. And some of these foods do have particular elements um, that can benefit our health beyond, um, beyond just our, the, the nutritional or the, the functional benefits of them. So th thinking about um, nutraceuticals, how they have to be implemented into our diet in a sustainable manner, and that eating blueberries once a month is not going to have significant impact on our health. Um, so all of these things combined can lead to a distrust of the term nutraceuticals or functional foods, thinking that, okay, no, that's just a, a you know, it's just a gimmicky term, kind of as a shift away from the term superfoods and seeing as it's kind of um, being oversimplified. So as it stands now, there's no need for that to happen, but depending on how we um, educate the general population about nutraceuticals, that could happen. Another potential downfall is connecting to the first one is elevated costs, um, seeing nutraceuticals as a premium product, because that will not benefit the general population. That will benefit a minimum population um, and will not ultimately benefit humanity. Um, the con continued focus on profit over people, um, really thinking about, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times in this presentation, is thinking about our benefits for longevity for generations to come. And that's not only on the physiological health, it's also thinking about the environment in which we live and the way that um, people have access to not only foods, but healthcare. So also the uh, focus primarily on supplements rather than foods. Again, supplements are generally a premium product and they are um, a for-profit venture, venture, right? Foods are as well, but they can also be grown. They can be found in the environment. Um, they, it, it really it helps if people have, can grow them in their own home, um, then it really empowers them to uh, disconnect income with well-being. And so thinking about the preventative effect of this. My recommendations moving forward is to remove or reduce premiums on nutraceutical foods and products. Think about the equi equitable distribution of this wealth of this massive, uh, this massive market, right? Um, we're thinking we're, it's 450 billion dollar market. Um, and so indigenous populations to should participate, lead, and benefit from the knowledge that is generated, often because the inspiration in this knowledge comes from indigenous populations. So they should uh, also be included um, and even lead a lot of these efforts and um, uh, be able to 
take claim in its success. Um, be aware of how market costs and supply chain practices of functional foods and nutraceuticals impact local eating patterns and culture and food security. So because um, uh, amaranto is now seen as a nutraceutical food that is really harvested and exported um, worldwide, we don't want it to mean that the uh, it makes the price so high that it is no longer accessible to the populations for whom it is important. A focus away from the industry benefit and uh, which is continue, it's important to continue to keep healthy since I think it's impossible to assume that the private sector will not continue to, to kind of move this forward, but really again, shifting or finding a balance between industry benefit and our uh, effect on our long-term well-being as humanity. Consider multifaceted effects of regulation along the food and supply chain and prioritize the well-being of those that are those who are most at risk. And so thinking about people who are most at risk of, um, of chronic diseases and how can we make the benefit of um, nutraceuticals more accessible to them. Also focused on shortening distances, elevating local nutraceuticals. So not thinking that we need to access nutraceuticals that are imported from the other side of the world, but actually elevating what are our local nutraceuticals and functional foods that these can easily be found in our markets and even collected in our environment. Okay. <laughs> um, these are, uh, this is accessible to you as well if you wanna read more about the nutraceuticals. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I will pause now for a sec and see if anybody has any questions. De nuevo, pueden hacer sus preguntas en español. Eh, vamos a tratar de traducir las preguntas y respuestas en inglés y en español. Thank you very much, Sasha, for this lovely presentation. Uh, we're going to wait and see if anyone has questions. Uh, uh, por todos los que están con nosotros po, co, por YouTube, eh, pueden colocar las preguntas. Si tienen eh, preguntas para Sasha, pues pueden escribir las preguntas, colocarlas en los comentarios en el YouTube Live para poder hacer la pregunta directamente a Sasha. Gracias. If there are no questions, uh, you can feel free. I think there's a way that you can um, contact me directly. Um, if not, feel free to respond to the email sent by the organizers and I'll be happy to respond to your questions um, in the days following this webinar. Sasha, vemos que en, en el chat aún no hay preguntas. Creo que están un poquito ahí las personas muy tímidas en cuanto a la información, pero como bien sabemos, ¿dónde podemos encontrar la información de esta eh, básicamente conferencia que tenemos en cuanto a la relevancia de neutra? Eh, de lo que usted nos estaba hablando. Eh, pues por suerte eh, es un tema que aunque el término en sí puede parecer nuevo para muchos, eh, eh, los medios eh, pues hablan mucho de los nutracéuticos, ¿verdad? Entonces si, si eh, encuentran información acerca de los probióticos, si encuentran información acerca de fibra, eh, de vitaminas antioxidantes, todo eso pues eh, son diferentes categorías de nutracéuticos. Entonces, por suerte, sí, es, es algo que, se, que um, hoy en día, eh, más con la pandemia COVID, hay más interés en, en, en ver cuáles son los componentes de nuestra dieta que apoyan nuestra salud. Eh, pero siguiendo los medios, idealmente si son eh, medios confiables, eh, sí es una forma de mantenerse pues al tanto del desarrollo de temas de, de nutracéuticos. So the question was, uh, where can we kind of find more information about nutraceuticals? And um, I responded that uh, luckily uh, today in aging, if you are not familiar with the term nutraceuticals uh, as, as kind of a, an umbrella category, there are a lot, a, uh, there's a lot of discussion and access to information about different categories of nutraceuticals. So um, for example, some subcategories of nutraceuticals are, as I mentioned, are probiotics, fiber, prebiotics, um, vitamins and minerals, antioxidants. And so those are likely terms that you are familiar with. And so I suggest um, just being aware of developments in the media. And if you feel comfortable, staying on top of uh, research uh, directly to, to read it um, firsthand and seeing how diet can impact your overall health. 
Muchísimas gracias, Sasha, por esta información tan importante. Ya lo saben, si ustedes quieren recibir más información, ¿dónde te podemos contactar? Eh, me pueden seguir en mis diferentes páginas de Instagram. Eh, también me pueden escribir a mi correo. Lo que sí es que se los voy a compartir en, en el WhatsApp y tal vez me hacen favor de compartirlo en el YouTube. Ok, ya saben que pueden conseguir a través de las redes sociales a Sasha para poder tener mayor información, creo que más adelante también es un tema muy importante como bien lo mencionaba Sasha en cuanto a esta situación que estamos pasando de pandemia y es importante nutrir al cuerpo con los nutrientes necesarios. Sasha, de, queremos agradecerle en nombre de Universidad Galileo y también de la Sociedad Internacional de las Ciencias Fitocosméticas por esta información en cuanto a todo este contenido de valor Gracias eh, por darnos eh, su tiempo y estar acá con nosotros. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y agradecemos a todas las personas que se conectaron a través de este en vivo que estábamos realizando a través de eh, nuestra plataforma de YouTube de Universidad Galileo. Recuerden que este es un evento donde hablamos acerca de la relevancia de los eh, nutracéuticos en el año 2022 y más allá, una perspectiva socioanalítica que, como ustedes se dieron cuenta, nuestra expositora Sasha nos dio a conocer diferentes puntos de vista, también nos da a conocer las recomendaciones y cómo nosotros podemos tomar eh, de, eh, de relevancia todo esto, este tipo de, de contenido y también su eh, ficha bibliográfica para que ustedes puedan tener en cuenta dónde pueden conseguir mayor información. Mi nombre es Héctor Chinchilla y nos vemos en una próxima ocasión.